whatever. All right, so transition to extra uterine life. Um, so babes for the first six to eight hours, I typically say six to 12 hours, um, require close monitoring and assessment. You're doing vitals typically every 30 minutes for the first couple hours of life. Um, because they have small body surface areas, so they can, they can kind of, what we say, tank very quickly. Um, they uh, kind of go down quick, if you will. So first period of reactivity, the first 30 minutes after birth, they seem to be like really alert and almost like surprisingly weird. So that they were just like born and they're wide awake and looking at you. Um, and it's a good time for bonding and breastfeeding, which is why we kind of do like what we call the power hour for the first hour of life where we try to um, do as little hands-on with the babe as possible and let mom just kind of skin to skin and do her thing um, because it's a great time for that. Um, so then after about an hour, 60 to 100 minutes, I don't know where we come up with these numbers, but um, that's when they get kind of tired again and they, they sleep for a while. Um, second period of reactivity, two to eight hours. Again, it kind of just depends. Every baby is different. So just know that, you know, that in a, in a normal newborn, they're typically going to sleep between like 21 and 23 hours a day because they're so, t you know, they're, this is, it's new to them. So, so the, when we talk about adaptations to extra uterine life, um, respiratory, obviously that's the biggest one. We need this babe to breathe. Um, it, we need to make sure that they're establishing critical, um, and effective respirations. And so, um, we just need to make sure that they, sorry guys, I didn't see that you weren't here. Sorry. Um, so when you talk about mechanical, um, I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, they had a C-section and that babe's having a little trouble breathing. They just didn't get the squeeze. Um, what they're talking about is that squeeze through that vaginal canal that kind of squeezes out some of that excess fluid and things that help keep their alveoli open. Um, and so sometimes C-section babes end up having a little bit of respiratory distress initially because they kind of have to work out that excess fluid on their own versus it kind of just naturally happening. Um, okay. So once we've established respiratory, then, then thermo is the most important thing. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about thermal regulation in a little bit here. But respirations, when you're assessing a baby, obviously you can see on the screen, normal values, they breathe faster than we do. So what's normal in an adult? Right, so in a baby, if they're resting, they're not crying, you would expect them to be between 30 and 60. And you count for a full minute on a babe when you're doing their respirations always. Why is that? Because they're kind of normal rhythms. Yep, so they're kind of sporadic breathers is what I like to call them. So they might breathe five or six times and then they have a pause. And then they'll breathe seven or eight times and then a pause. And then five or six times and then a pause. And so it's not a reliable count if you count for 30 seconds and times it by two. Because we don't, I mean, that's just not effective for them. Um... The other thing too with them is their breathing can be shallow and irregular, so you just need to make sure you count for a whole minute. Um, everybody kind of does things different, but when I count respirations, and again, I've been a NICU nurse for years, but I always put my hand on their chest. I'm not actually listening to their respirations. I put my hand on their chest and I feel, and um, I listen to their respirations at some point, obviously during my assessment, but when I'm actually counting, I put my hand on their chest and that's how I count. Everybody kind of does their own thing. Neither is, is wrong. But if you do it that way, you still want to make sure you do a respiratory assessment on the baby. Um, so they have thinner chest walls, so their breathing sounds are louder. Um, it's not uncommon for them to have rowels in the first two hours. Again, related to that excess fluid that they're trying to kind of work through. Um... Okay, so when we talk about respirations, respiratory distress, or RDS, um, it's a respiratory rate over 60 without crying. Um, respiratory rates under 30, that's actually like a CNS depressant type situation. So when they're breathing fast is when they're struggling to breathe. If they have abnormal breath sounds, so they have ronchi, rowels, crackles, wheezes, expiratory grunts after the first hour of life. Um, Sometimes you hear parents say, oh gosh, listen to them. They're making that noise and it sounds so cute. It's not cute. 
that's them grunting and, and struggling to breathe. Um, and so we have to kind of try to explain to parents that we don't really like that sound, um, as cute as it might sound. It's actually a sign that they're struggling a little bit. Um, so signs of distress. We talk about central cyanosis. So what is central cyanosis? The trunk, right? So you're gonna see a babe and you, it would not be abnormal to see a babe who's 10 hours old and their hands and their feet are still kind of purpley. What do we call that? Acrocyanosis. Acrocyanosis. That's not abnormal, especially in the first 24 hours of life. You start having central cyanosis, that's always going to be abnormal. So just remember that. Signs of distress, nasal flaring, retractions. So you're gonna look between their ribs and they're gonna be what we almost call like, it's pulling, like their muscles are pulling in and you see retractions between their ribs. Um, seesaw breathing. Seesaw breathing is typically indicative of something way more serious. A lot of times that's indicative of like a diaphragmatic hernia. Um, so if you see seesaw breathing, we've got major problems. Um, and then apnea lasting longer than 20 seconds. Why is that important? Because babes are periodic breathers. So it wouldn't necessarily be abnormal for them to go 10 seconds without taking a breath. So apnea is truly defined as 20 seconds or longer of no breathing. So just so you guys know that. Um, we don't need to do critical thinking this early on. Come on. What was I thinking? Um, okay. So cardiac assessment. They have compression of the chest um, in an ideal world through a vaginal delivery. Like I said, they kind of get that squeeze. Um, and then the act of the chest expanding happens when they take that first breath. And so it creates, as it says there, like a cascade of things that, that come from there. Um, other important factors is they have a temperature shift when they're born. They're in this nice little warm environment. They come out, they're wet, they're slippery, they're slimy, and they get cold real quick. So just remember that. Um, and then cutting of the umbilical cord. What is the big thing that's occurring right now with a lot of hospitals and OBs? Mm -hmm. So a lot of doctors, if you have a baby that's born that comes out crying and, and is vigorous, they're doing delayed cord clamping for up to a minute post-delivery. And what is the rationale behind that? The blood flow to the baby. Mm -hmm. So they get a little bit of a boost, so to speak, of blood flow from, that, from the mom. Um, and it gives them time to kind of transition and get their lungs working and that kind of thing before we cut that cord and take that oxygen away from them because it's still an oxygen source while they're connected. So, okay, so this picture looks very, very confusing, but this is fetal circulation, okay? So things I want you to know. Fetal circulation is different than circulation once they are born, okay? Um, the stuff on the side, I'm not necessarily gonna test you on, but what I want you to know are these a couple circled things. Um, the ductus arteriosus, Sometimes you hear that referred to as a PDA, and what that means is that it's a patent ductus arteriosus, meaning it's open. And the foramen ovale, so PFO, again, patent foramen ovale. And then there's one more that I don't know if I have it on here. It's in the liver, it's, called, oh yeah, there it is. It's not circled, but it's the ductus venosus. Those three things are very important in fetal circulation. And typically in a healthy newborn, they close very, like the ductus venosus, the one in the liver is the first one to close. And typically that one can close as soon as like eight hours after they're born. Um, the PFO or the foramen, Peyton foramen or valley, um, that one usually closes second and sometimes that can be 24 to 48 hours of life. And the most important thing with fetal circulation is this patent ductus arteriosus. The reason that that is so important is if you have a baby um, that's born, and I'm gonna talk about heart defects, so I hope I'm not triggering anything. Nope. Um, a baby that's born with a heart defect, there are certain conditions where this patent ductus arteriosus is what keeps them alive because it allows blood to flow where the heart defect doesn't if that makes sense and so this one is usually the last one to close and um 
there there's not like a specific timeline in some in some babies it can close 24 to 48 hours but then there are other babies that may have a, a patent ductus arteriosus and they're still eight months old and it's just that's what's work that work it's what works for them and eventually it closes now when we talk about heart defects and it, them being pda dependent is what we call them we have to give them a medicine to keep that patent ductus arteriosus open okay i don't i'm not going to go through heart defects i don't expect you guys to know which heart defects um would be pda dependent but I want you to understand that that patent ductus arteriosus is very important to fetal circulation and it becomes important to a baby who has a heart defect. That's what I want you guys to know about that. Okay? And the ductus venosus basically allows to bypass the liver. Mm -hmm. And that one's, like I said, is the first to close. So, um, okay. So there's kind of a little bit more talk about patent ductus arteriosus. And correct me if I'm wrong, your son had a co right? Okay, so coarctation is one of the most common, and so it's on here, and we kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, it's characterized by the narrowing of the aorta near the insertion of the ductus arteriosus, so it's very close to the PDA. Um, and this, in her situation especially, um, this is a, a heart defect that sometimes can get missed a lot um, because it's hard to detect unless the babe is symptomatic, which is what happened with your son, correct? So we have had a patient um, in the NICU that um, was a preterm babe and, you know, was on constant monitoring, was on the ventilator, um, and just we could not get this kid off the ventilator. And so finally, like six weeks of life, the doctor finally said, let's just do an echo. Let's, we haven't done an echo. Like, we've kind of exhausted everything. We, we've done a round of steroids. We cannot get this kid off the vent. Sure enough, this kid has a co -arc. And then... It's like, holy shit, how did we miss this? And then we have to send this kid to Children's who's six weeks old and we just discovered the co -arc. So then we feel bad, like, how did we miss this? But unfortunately with co sometimes they can be so small. And depending on the picture that they get during that echo, even in an echo, it can sometimes be missed. So. I think also the symptoms, like my son, because his co was so bad, like his aorta was only open a millimeter. Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends on how mm -hmm. narrow the aorta is. Um, and when those symptoms do come on. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. And again, every babe presents differently. So coarc is one of the most common. And then the other one that's super, super common is transposition of the great arteries. Um, and those transpositions are real easy to pick up. Like you can't miss those on echo. So, but again, we're not going to focus on heart defects, but okay. So vital signs, apical pulse. So where's that? Right here. And again, you're going to listen for a full minute. And why is that? Yeah. Yep. When they have abnormal breathing, they have abnormal heart rates. Um, and so there can be pauses. And um, again, with preterm babes, sometimes you're listening to their heart, their heart rate and their heart rates are higher because they're preterm. And so you're counting, counting, counting. And you're like, oh my God, I have a heart rate of 160. And then all of a sudden you hear like this complete pause and you look up at the screen and their heart rate is 55 because they're preterm and they stopped breathing for a second. So um, babies, they just like to, you know, keep you on your toes. Okay, so when we talk about heart rate range, um, in a term baby, it's not abnormal to have a heart rate as low as 85. You don't always see that, but that would be like a, a serious, like the babe is sound asleep, very much resting. Um, as high as 180 when they're crying. Now in neonates, so preterm babes, 180 might be their normal heart rate. And when they're crying, it's 210. But again, that's related to being preterm. Usual range, 110 to 160 is kind of where we typically see patients. Um, again, any abnormal findings should be reevaluated within 30 minutes. Um, and has anyone listened to a baby yet? It's fast. I mean, when you're used to counting like a 60, 70, you know, beats per minute, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, this baby's heart rate's 150. It takes a little bit. Um, the one thing I will say that is always helpful is like when you have your stethoscope on the chest and you're holding it, tap it out with your finger. That's what I always, that's how I learned was to tap it out because then it like you can see. And then if you're doing an assessment 
and a practitioner is waiting for a heart rate, if they see you tapping like this, they know the baby's okay. But if they see you going like this, then they know, shoot, we might need to do something. We might need to resuscitate. So I, that's how I learned was just to tap it out. But whatever works for you guys. Um, okay, brachial and femoral pulses should be um, present and equal. You should be able to feel those on babes. They're little, so they shouldn't have any issues. Yeah. Yep, so that's a good question. So um, on an infant or a child, if you have a heart rate 60 or less, you're going to start chest compressions. Um, and I always tell people when you talk about resuscitation in children versus adults, in an adult, when you're doing CPR, what's the problem? It's usually their heart. In kids, when you're doing CPR, it's usually airway. So if you have a kid who has a heart rate of 60, are they breathing? Is their airway obstructed? So you, even though you might have a heart rate of 60, you might start chest compressions while the practitioner's intubating. And once they intubate and start bagging that kid and getting them oxygenated, you'll see their heart rates come up. Now that's not always the case. In preterm babies, it's a different story. But most of the time when you have a kid that goes down and you do CPR, it's airway related. So that's the difference between adults and, and children. Um, okay, talk about blood pressures. Um, 60s to 80s systolics and 40s to 50s for diastolics. Um, when you want to talk about um, uh, like blood pressure support in, in babes or you know kids who need it, we focus on the math a lot. I think you guys do the same in the ICU, right? Um, so when we talk about a preterm babe, we expect their math to be what their gestational age is. Some doctors will say gestational age plus five. So for example, you're taking care of a 24 weeker and they have a map of 20, you're gonna, you're gonna intervene and you're gonna do something about that. But if you have a 24 weeker who has a map of 31 and they're not on blood pressure support, you're like jumping for joy. So that's kind of, um, the map is kind of where we sit with blood pressures. Um, okay. The goal, what's the low end of the map, I'm sorry? Um, the gestational age. So if you're taking care of a term baby, we don't typically take blood pressures on the term babes at Women's Hospital unless we suspect a problem. Um, so, but if you did, you would want that map to be at least 40 if they were a 40 weeks gestation. If they were 38 weeks, you'd want it to be at least 38. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so thermogenic system. So you need to read this and you need to remember this. After establishing respirations and circulation, what is the next critical step? Thermal regulation. I know they say airway, breathing, circulation. So we've done airway and breathing and we've done the circulation. So add thermal regulation to that. Um, obviously that's the definition of thermal regulation. I think we all kind of know what that is. Um, why are they at risk for heat loss? So they have thin layers of subcutaneous fat. They don't have any fat. Um, their blood vessels are close to the surface of the skin. They have changes in environment, environmental temp drastically affect them because they don't have body surface area, you know, and they don't have subcutaneous fat. Um, babes can't shiver. When we get cold, we shiver and that produces heat. Babies can't do that. So, um, let's see here. So thermoregulation, their immature neurologic system and their neuromuscular system. Um, thermogenesis, neonates increase muscular, or excuse me, Increase muscle activity to generate heat when cold, so they increase their oxygen and glucose consumption. So, non-shivering thermo, like I said, they can't shiver because they um, don't have the capability of doing that. So, whatever brown fat that they do have, they burn that for energy, which then leads to what? Low blood glucose levels. Yep. Um, so this thermoregulation leads to a huge, huge, huge problem in infants. Um, and I was going to do a class activity, but let's just kind of breeze through this here. Hang on. So this part right here, I have been a NICU nurse for almost 16 years and I still have problems with this. I don't know why everybody has their thing. This is my thing, but they, these are the sources of heat loss, um, in infants and so you need to know these and you need to be able to tell me what would be an example of these okay so when we talk about convection that's flow of body heat from body surface area to a cooler ambient air 
So can anyone think of like an example of, of a convection type of heat loss? Fan. What? Like a fan blowing on the mm -hmm. mm hmm Okay, so conduction. Loss of body heat to cooler surface areas in direct contact. So what would that be? Set on a cool surface. Mm -hmm. Diaper changing stations. Yep. Major. Radiation. Loss of body heat from body surface to cooler solid surface in not indirect contact, but close. By a window. So yeah, so for example, when you're setting up your nursery and you have a window and that window faces north, are you gonna put the crib under that window? No. Are you gonna put the crib under any window? No. Probably not. But especially a north facing one in Nebraska in the winter, probably not a good idea. Um, and then evaporation. This is the biggest one at birth. They're, they come out, they're wet. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna dry them off and we're gonna get them wrapped up in a blanket and we're gonna do what else? Put a hat on because why? They lose most of their heat from their head. So I don't know why I struggle with these, but I do. And so I want you guys to remember these because they will be on the test. Yes? For which one? Cool yeah, so like if you take a baby that's like in a onesie or something and you take that onesie off of them and you set them on the diaper changing station that doesn't have a changing pad or something, um, it's a cold surface and they're warm and so they lose heat that way. Okay. Um, the other thing, you know, just would be like even just taking them from the warm bath and setting them on a bed. Like they went from a warm <clears throat> to a bed, which by all rights isn't cold, but compared to the bath that they were in, they're gonna lose heat that way, but they're also gonna lose heat through evaporation because they're wet. So this is why I get confused with these because I think there's a lot of things that you can kind of almost say, well, it kind of falls under two of the three or two of the four or whatever. Um, and so, I don't know. Again, everybody has their thing. This is my thing, don't judge me. <laughs> I struggle with these. So please study these because there will be questions about these. Um, okay, we kind of just talked about the nurse takes the following actions to prevent heat loss in a newborn. Identify which mechanism of heat loss is related to each action. She dries the infant quickly after birth. Evaporation. Places the infant in a pre-warmed crib or skin to skin with mother. Mm -hmm. Places the crib in the middle of the nursery or away from windows. And keeps the room temperature at constant warm level. So the caveat to that with the room temperature that I will say that we always kind of teach parents is you want babes to be warm, but if you keep, like for example, if you keep your house at 70 degrees, you don't want to turn the house up to 75 because you're bringing a baby home. Because one, you're going to die of heat. Um, and two, the babe will adapt. So for the first few days that you're home, you maybe put the baby in a onesie and a sleeper and wrap them in a blanket. And then you check their temp every once in a while to make sure they're warm. And then they adjust to their, their environment. Now, the caveat to that would be, if you keep your house at 62, you might want to maybe adjust it a little bit. But don't turn your house up to 75 just because they were in the NICU and it's 72 degrees in there all the time. So what was the last one? What was the last one? Yeah. Convention. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about cold stress, and this is how important it is to keep babies warm because it creates a cascade of things in babies. If we don't keep them warm, it seems so simple in, in us. Like if we're cold, we just throw a blanket on or we throw a sweatshirt on or whatever the case may be. And we figure it out and our body compensates. But in babies, they try to compensate, but it leads to severe problems because they're so small. So if they are cold and we're not treating that cold. We're not getting them warm. Um, they have increased respiratory rates, which then relates to increased oxygen needs. Um, they have an increased um, base, um, basal metabolic rate. They have increased glucose consumption and decreased tissue perfusion. So just those two alone, increased glucose consumption is then going to lead to what? They're going to break down brown fat to get warm. And then that brown fat is going to result in low blood sugars, correct? And then if you have decreased tissue perfusion, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see a drop in their blood pressures. So you already are seeing two major systems affected just simply because the baby is cold. 
So um, diversion of oxygen and energy is away from the brain cells, cardiac function and growth to the process of just simply keeping them warm, which then leads to its own problems. So you can see how this is like a cascade of things. Um, they go into respiratory and metabolic acidosis. They have unbound bilirubin, which leads to what? Jaundice, which is its own problem. And then they end up with hypoglycemia. So keeping a baby warm is extremely important. Um, for those of you, there's the normal temperature ranges. Um, Methodist does Fahrenheit, but some hospitals do Celsius. So just so you guys know. Um, we kind of talked about abnormal ranges and what those could be, infection. Sometimes if mom has a fever, then babe's gonna be born with fever because he was in a 101 degree environment, so. Okay, voiding. Um, right, what you need to know is to, a lot of times they'll end up voiding like right at delivery. But what I want you to take away from the renal system is what is considered normal by three to four days of life is a babe should have six to eight wet diapers in a day. If they don't, there's problems. Okay, so you guys did your drug cards um, for skills lab or whatever. Um, but vitamin K was talked about. So why do we give vitamin K? To help with clotting because the gut is, the babies are born with their guts, they're sterile. And so they don't have that bacteria to help synthesize the vitamin K. And so we, we give the vitamin K to jumpstart and help with their clotting. And then by 24 hours of age, their guts are producing the bacteria needed. That That's why we don't have to continue giving them vitamin K. Hmm? Yeah, I, um, I, never heard I So the hepatic system, um, basically what I want you to take away from this is that the intestinal tract doesn't have the bacteria needed to synthesize vitamin K, which is why we give it. Immune system. So babes get passive immunity of IgG um, from the mom, and they have that even after birth if the mom is not breastfeeding for about three months. If the mom continues to breastfeed, they're getting that passive immunity from the mom. Um, the babes are developing their own IgM by eight weeks, and breast milk also gives IgA. Um, but basically just what I want you to know is breastfeeding um, helps with passive immunity. All newborns are at risk for infection. I mean, that just kind of makes sense. Okay, so jaundice. Who's seen jaundice before? So it's the yellowing of the skin and the scleras. Um, and it happens in babes because their liver's immature. I mean, everything about them, they're, you know, just learning how to function. Um, there's two types, physiologic and pathologic. Does anybody know the difference? Mm -hmm. Would you say? Like a blockage. Mm -hmm. So the takeaway from this is um, know the difference between physiologic and pathologic. And then if, Billy, if jaundice is left untreated, it can lead to what they call bilirubin encephalopathy or conicterus. And what that is, is the, the yellowing goes to the brain the jaundice goes to the bilirubin goes to the brain and it causes yellowing and it causes um it can cause like mental retardation and things like that now when i say left untreated um we're talking like these babes would have to have numbers of like 20 or 21 or 22. it's not mm -hmm. abnormal to see a newborn have a number that's like 16 and then we start treatment but if we let it get up to 21 22 23 they they could potentially have some brain damage yeah So it, it's been thought that, um, that uh, treatment of jaundice with the phototherapy lights was um, not harmful and it didn't have really have any side effects. And now there's some studies out there that are saying that, that, that treatment could lead to some side effects. I have not read the studies, but um, I just feel like I would rather have my kid treated and not have brain damage. So I think that the studies are new and I think that a lot of places are jumping a little quick, but 
um, yeah, you have to kind of follow the protocol. And insurance companies won't pay for like home treatment unless the bilirubin is 14 or higher. So that, I mean, that's something that they have taken into consideration too. So yeah, so every hospital has their kind of their own protocol that they follow. So yeah. What's normal bilirubin level? Um, so that's kind of a great question. Um, it's based on gestational age and hours old. And so it changes, and I'm not gonna test you on this, so you don't need to know that, but it changes based on how many weeks gestation the baby is and how many hours old they are. So as they get a little bit older and their liver starts kind of kicking in, we tolerate a higher number, if that makes sense. Yes? What was the difference between physiological and pathological? Who said it? Well, physiological is just like normal, um, and then pathological would be like abnormal, like something's wrong there. So yeah, so physiologic. Um, like my baby, when he was born, he had some jaundice, and it was like small amounts, but it was just because his liver was immature. Mm -hmm. and, and there's like, also something called breastfeeding jaundice, where like people, moms who breastfeed, their babies are just like constantly like kind of that yellowish color. That's more of like a physiologic thing. And pathologic is is going to be like what Jackie was saying. Like you've got an infection, you've got an obstruction, you have a liver that's not working. Does that make sense? Yes. Does the um, the ability to like stay in the hospital and receive treatment and get the like the light at home just depend on insurance? Yep. So um, yeah, it kind of just depends. So like I when I had Bennett, I wanted to go home. And that the day that I wanted to go home, his bilirubin that morning was kind of high. Okay. And so they said, you know, because you were a C-section, you have the option to stay another day and it would be beneficial in case he gets started on lights. Mm -hmm. So we ended up staying another day the next day, his hit, it was lower. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I want to say the number and Lindsay might be right. They might have changed the protocol, but prior to me hearing about the protocol change, 14 was the number. Okay. So if you have a babe that's in the hospital and wants, they want to go home, but they need phototherapy, if their insurance won't pay for it, they either get admitted to the NICU or they go home and wait till it gets to 14 and then they get phototherapy. Just kind of a risk they take. So, okay. Skin colors, um, at birth, normal skin color is purplish red. We kind of talked about the acrocyanosis. <coughs> um, abnormal findings, central cyanosis. They should not, they should not be having that. Um, early jaundice, so if you have jaundice levels that are extremely high within the first 24 hours, that is a problem. That is going to be the babe has something physically wrong with them and it requires investigation. What's the necrocyte? What'd you say? Why does he have a Oh my gosh, I didn't even notice that. They all do. They all do. Yeah. Well, the first one's blue and the second two are pink. But... That's strange. And also, I love that the babe, the babe at the bottom is face planting. When they're, like, right after they're born. Once you've, like, resuscitated them, so to speak, like, they're breathing, they're dry, then you put the braces on. Yeah. Okay, so molding. We've all kind of know about molding. Um... Their skeleton, their their skulls are made to, to be able to get through the birth canal. They have to move so that they can get through the canal. Um, and so you see what we call molding. Some people use terms like cone head and things like that. Try to avoid those in front of parents because that can be kind of offensive. Um, but their skulls are meant to do this. It returns to a normal shape eventually. So... <laughs> So there you can kind of see their sutures and their fontanelles. Um, these should not be fused. They should be what we call soft spots and you should be able to feel them. Um, okay, so we talk about a caput. You see this, it's scalp edema and it disappears within three to four days. It's usually related to like a vacuum extraction. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Has anyone seen this? It's not fun to watch. No, you don't. Um, okay, a cephalohematoma. You can kind of see on the, the first picture kind of that swelling that's there. Um, 
those take longer to resolve, usually two to eight weeks. Um, there's no discoloration of the scalp, but there is visible swelling. Compare and contrast. Um, what's the difference? What the key thing that you need to know that would be like the defining words in a test question is that a caput crosses their suture lines and a cephalohematoma does not. So when I'm talking about a cephalohematoma, it's gonna be on the left side and the left side only. A caput could start on the left side and cross over that suture line and be on the right side as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the key. Now, this is a subgaleal hemorrhage. In adults, we talk about subdural bleeds and those are pretty much the most severe, right? In adults, right? Mm -hmm. In adult, I mean, in ICU patients, I, I don't do ICU, so. The bad, the bad brain bleeds in adults. This would be a bad bleed in, in a babe. This, um, if you see this, we, um, they're gonna have a boggy scalp, they're gonna be tachycardic, and their head circumference is gonna be increasing daily because this is a major brain, like a major bleed um, from delivery. I've only seen one in, in my whole career. And um, these babies, because it's such a big bleed, they're very much at risk for dying from this. The one that I saw thankfully did not, and he recovered and did not have um, deficits. But one of the scariest things I've ever seen because there's just so much blood in that scalp. And when you feel their head, it's, it's scary. Very, very scary. So this is kind of a picture. Um, okay, now we move on to hips. So you talk about hip dislocations. Um, you can kind of see the picture of a normal hip and then what some hip dislocations look like. Um, babes are, their hips, their, their joints are just kind of loose and so hip dislocation is pretty common in babes. Some kids, um, you know, they do a check on, um, like the pediatricians do a check and sometimes they pop out and they pop right back in. Um, and some kids, they're dislocated and require braces and so it's important to have that checked because you wanna get that fixed when they're young before they start to have problems with walking and things like that. Um, it's just something that pediatricians and like our neonates check on all the preterm babies too, so. Um, okay, so this is what I was saying when I say they do the check. It's the, I'm not gonna test you over this question, but this is how they, they like do an abduction to feel if, the, if it pops in and out. I don't think I wanna know what that feels like. Doesn't sound pleasant. Um, okay, so when we talk about genitalia, um, urethra in, in males, it should be at the very tip of the penis. And if it's not, that's what we call a hypospadias. And that's something that has to be surgically fixed. Um, the key takeaway from that is if it's not at the tip, we don't circumcise them in the hospital because they use that extra skin to fix the problem, if that makes sense. Um, and then with females, it's not abnormal to see like swelling, um, in their genital areas, especially because a lot of that is, um, mom's hormones initially, and it takes time for their bodies to kind of get rid of that. And so it's not abnormal to see, um, swelling. So don't be surprised if you see that. Poop. We get to talk about poop. Meconium. Has anyone changed the meconium diaper? How fun is that? So meconium is what's in their intestines the whole time that they're in utero. Um, and in an ideal world, it stays in them until they're born. Um, and then it comes out and it's like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, really dark green. it's like dark green, almost black in some instances. And it's like tar, like it's almost impossible to get off their bottoms. It's super sticky. You feel like you're like rubbing their skin raw to get it off because it's just so sticky. Um, but in some instances, um, this happens where the babe has their first bowel movement in utero. And so then we have meconium stained fluid and that becomes a problem for what reason? So when they're born, if they take that big breath and they get a gulp of that dirty fluid, what can that lead to? Yeah, so meconium aspiration syndrome is what we call that. You don't need to know that, but it leads to pneumonia. 
which is obviously not good in babes. Um, okay, so meconium is kind of that first stool. And I say first stool, it's usually the first couple of stools. Sometimes it can be like the first three or four, depending on the baby. And then they have what's kind of transitional, which is a little bit of meconium and a little bit of what we call stool. And then it gets to um, what we call normal. In breastfeeding babes, it's usually kind of like a yellow seedy is what we call it. Um, and in formula fed babes, it's just kind of normal looking stool. It's not usually yellow and seedy like breastfed babes. All right, any questions about poop? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the umbilical cord. What I want you to know about this. The umbilical cord contains three vessels. It's got two arteries in one vein. If we have a babe that's born with less than three vessels, that's something that we tend to investigate. And as it says right there, it's usually they have the vein and they have one artery. And what the reason that it can indicate abnormal renal problems is because of the development and the timing of when things are developed. So if you have a baby that's born, it's, we call it just a two vessel cord. Um, a lot of times you might see like renal ultrasounds being done on those babies to just assure that their kidneys are appropriately functioning. Um, Wharton's jelly, we've all seen umbilical cords, right? So the Wharton's jelly is just that cushy stuff that surrounds those vessels and protects those vessels. And it, it is kind of like jelly feeling if anybody has touched a cord before. Um, their umbilicus should be midline. It should be intact. There shouldn't be any openings or anything. Um, free of redness and drainage. The cord clamp that we put on right after delivery, <coughs> typically we like to leave that on at least 24 hours. After that, you're free to take it off. Um, people ask about things like, should we get the, can we put the babe in the bath with the umbilical cord when it's drying and things like that? All of those things are appropriate. It's, they, they don't do, um, like some places used to use like alcohol and things to kind of dry the cords and get them to fall off sooner. We don't do any of that stuff. We still just bathe them like normal and it falls off when it falls off. So, um, okay, so sleep wake cycles. We kind of talked about sleeping and how they typically sleep a lot of times 21 to even 23 hours a day when they're first born. Um, they have the two sleep cycles. They have deep sleep and light sleep just like we do. Um, but when they're awake, they have a little bit more than we do because we're awake and we're awake. Um, they have kind of what we call like a drowsy state. I mean, I know that we can be drowsy and not want to be awake, but we're still awake and can function. Their, their drowsy state, they're usually pretty tired still. They may kind of kind of fade in between sleep and awake. Um, they have what we call quiet alert, which is when they might just be laying in their crib or their bassinet and they're awake, but they're not crying. They're not really doing much. They're just kind of looking around. It's, you know, kind of cute to watch. Um, active alert is they're awake and they're moving around and they want someone to talk to them. They want someone to engage with them. And then we have crying, which is the obvious, like I'm, I'm mad. I want a diaper change. I want a bottle. I want to breastfeed. I want someone to hold me because I'm tired of being in this bassinet. So these are kind of the different stages. I like E, it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the active alert, especially on this babe, because this babe looks like, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> so, crying. Why do babies cry? It's the only way they can communicate. So, are they hungry? Are they in pain? Do they want attention? Do they not feel good? Um, nobody really knows, because they, they cry for all of those things. I think as parents, you kind of learn which cry is which, eventually. Um, but yeah, I mean, they cry for all these reasons and it's their first social communication. So that's, it should be, as they describe it, kind of a lusty cry. It shouldn't be a weak cry and it shouldn't be high pitched. Um, high pitched cries a lot of times indicate some sort of neurologic deficit or defect. So when you hear high pitched crying, it's not, that's not normal. There was a speech language lady who actually deciphered the cries and created a key. Mm -hmm. Okay, so reflexes, um, their normal, their nervous system is primitive. They have some reflexes when they're first born, but as they get older, the, those reflexes develop. Um, the sucking reflex is, I mean, it's there. Like, they know that immediately. Um, 
I, I don't think I ask a ton of questions about these. Um, if you look at the table, I think it has pictures of all the different ones. I don't, I don't think I ask about these though. Um, okay, so newborn diagnoses, again, I don't, we don't need to talk about those. Um, okay, a nurse is performing an assessment on a newborn who was born 10 minutes ago. Which of the following is the highest priority assessment? What'd you guys say? Mm -hmm. Vital signs, yep. Okay, so the nurse is caring for a new mother and her newborn. The patient expresses concern that the newborn's feet look purple, blue, and despite the patient keeping the baby warm, what is the most appropriate response? See, yeah, it's normal. Their immature vascular system. Yep. That's not my baby. Any questions? Okay. You guys need another break or do you want to keep going? Okay, get it.